All right, well, why don't I go ahead and kick this off here? Hi all, and welcome to the Stewardship Network's monthly webcast. We're really pleased to have you here today. Um, want to encourage you all to make liberal use of the chat box and Q&A and ask any questions that you might have, any thoughts that you'd like to share, and go ahead and drop a, drop a line in the chat box and let us know where you're tuning in from. Really pleased to have you here. Um, the Stewardship Network, for those of you who don't know, is an award-winning 501c3 nonprofit. We've been around for more than 20 years. We have our geographically place-based member communities that are made up of all of the people and organizations that care for land and water in a specific geography. And just had a great call with all of the coordinators of those earlier this week. Lovely to be with them. And for those of you new to the Stewardship Network monthly webcast, we are here each and every second Wednesday of the month. And we've been doing this for more than 15 years back before we had iPhones and mobile devices. And we did all of this all the time. And so the thing that I always say to the team is like, all right, what's our next cutting edge thing? So find us, drop a, drop a recurring email, drop a recurring event into your calendar for the second Wednesday during the Eastern time zones, noon hour, Pacific Coast, 9 a.m. hour. And you'll find us here talking about all kinds of interesting things on this second Wednesday. Our mission is to connect, equip, and mobilize people and organizations to care for land and water in their communities. We do that through so many different ways. We mobilize through our member communities, as we say, making ecological stewardship accessible to all. We do so many different things um, in terms of ecological stewardship and love to be out in the field with, with folks we equip by providing all kinds of backbone support for our member communities so that they can be, as we say, we're gonna keep them out in the field doing the great work that they do. Um, we provide training and link them and event registration and all kinds of different things so that, um, as we say, they can be out in the communities. And then we connect folks through things like the Stewardship Network's monthly webcast. Um, and the whole idea is to share ideas and information as much as we can so that we can all learn from each other and, um, and, uh, and share information and, and um, gain as much insight as they can. And just a note, if you tried to get into the chat before and you couldn't, you can now. So take a moment and go ahead and drop it in. Uh, see if you can get your settings so that it's, uh, you're sending your chat to everyone, not just hosts and panelists, but again, take a moment, drop your, drop your cursor into that chat box and let us know where you're tuning in from. So thanks so much. And I'm really pleased to be here today uh, with you all to talk about bat monitoring with Ian Abelson from Six Rivers Land Conservancy, the stewardship manager there. So Ian, thanks so much for joining us today. Looking forward to learning more about bats. And great to have you, Melissa from Port Huron and Diana from Lansing, Lizzie tuning in from Detroit and from the Hanley Sanctuary. Steve, great to have you with us. Dan from Kalamazoo. Great, thanks. Keep those, keep those chats coming and Ian, why don't you take it away from here? Sounds good to me. All right, let me get the screen shared. Uh-oh, that's a spoiler. That's exactly, I know, that was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll just go backwards. Exactly. All right, there we go. Alsec, can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound great. All right, fantastic. Um, so hi everyone, my name's Ian Abelson. I'm the stewardship manager uh, for Six Rivers Land Conservancy. We are a nonprofit land conservancy in Southeast Michigan. We uh, have a service area of about five counties down there, just sort of north of Detroit. So we cover Oakland, Macomb, Lapeer, Genesee, and St. Clair counties. I was really excited to um, do this presentation today for sort of the stewardship, um, nonprofit folk, park uh, folk, everybody who's sort of in that realm, um, because I want to talk about bat monitoring. And so bats are something that have long been kind of ignored and thrown out of our species data collection. They're a species that it has historically been really, really difficult to get data on. And I'll talk about that a little more later, but it's partially just because, first of all, they're nocturnal. So they're out when we tend to not be out. Second of all, they're flying. So it's not like you can just set a nice, easy live trap line uh, down and take a look at your species and gather data from that. Uh, and lastly, they tend to be very, very fast. 
Um, so we've had to be very creative about how to gather data on bats. Uh, but it's recently gotten a bit easier for people who don't know a whole lot about bats or who don't have the knowledge to do a lot of intense field physical data collection to get some good info on the bats around them. So first off, a little bit about me. So I am the stewardship manager uh, with Six Rivers Land Conservancy. I've been with Six Rivers uh, first as a technician and then as manager uh, since 2018. But before I was with Six Rivers, I used to be a live animal educator, um, mostly focusing on nocturnal animals. Uh, and one of my focuses was bats. So I say this partially too, um, as a bit of a preface, I am not an acoustic ecologist. I don't have a PhD in bat biology. I was just a bat educator. Um, and this is still something that, uh, you know, you don't need a PhD in acoustic ecology or bat biology to be able to do. Um, so I was an education specialist with an organization called the Organization for Bat Conservation up until its closure in 2018. Um, worked with all sorts of different kinds of bats and some other animals, uh, but we are going to be focusing for today on US bats. So I understand that um, some of what I'm going to be saying is gonna be more applicable to Michigan than to every other state that people might be tuning in from. So let's go over just some stuff about US bats really quickly. So there are over 40 species um, of bats in the US. Exactly how many there are kind of depends on who you ask. We have a few species that you know, they're only in the Florida Keys or they just kind of barely breach over the border from Mexico. Um, but we have over 40 species in the US and that alone can be kind of surprising to a lot of folks. Uh, we have nine species that we usually talk about as being Michigan species. Most of our bats in the US are uh, insectivores. They're mostly just insect eaters. Of course, just because it's more fun, I put some other examples in the pictures on the left there. So. In the top left, that's a pallid bat with a scorpion in its mouth. And in the middle, that's one of our nectar drinking bats, the Mexican long tongued bat, uh, who is happily stealing some uh, sugar water from a hummingbird feeder there. Um, but the fact that our bats are mostly insect eaters is one of the big reasons we want to know more about them. And one of the big reasons they're so beneficial in the United States. So. Numbers for bats can be extrapolations and estimates a lot of the time, because like I was saying, they are a species that it's really difficult to gather good data on. But we say that each bat can eat maybe up to around 3,000 or so insects in a night. That depends a lot on the type of insect. You know, eating a gnat or a mosquito is a lot different from eating a beetle if you're a bat. Um, and in terms of pest control, those insects that they're eating uh, we estimate save farmers in the United States up to around $23 billion a year. Um, and again, that's an extrapolation, but that saved money is coming both from damages to crops that would otherwise be inflicted by the insects that the bats are eating. And it's also coming from the reduced amount of pesticide that farmers have to use because of the presence of bats. Um, so there was a study that was saying that the presence of one bat can potentially reduce or eliminate need for insecticide spraying on around two acres of land. That's a lot of land for just one bat. So they are really important to sort of our agriculture in the United States. Uh, and the fact that they do consume so many insects can also forestall some of the insect spread diseases. So things like malaria, um, you'd much rather have a lot of bats around than a lot of malaria around. Um, one of the things that almost all of our bats in the United States do uh, in terms of hunting insects is echolocation. Um, and I'm guessing a lot of folks who are on this call are probably uh, at least somewhat familiar with echolocation. Um, so it's a sound produced by bats um, that then bounces off of their environment around them and uh, returns to their ears, which is part of why a lot of the insect eating bat species um, in the United States have such prominent ears like that spotted bat uh, in the bottom picture there. That's not a Michigan bat, but it is a US bat. Um, they have kind of this fun cow pattern on them. Um, so they use their ears and they use this echolocation a lot to hunt. 
but echolocation tends to be above human hearing. So it ranges from around 20 kilohertz to around 120 kilohertz. Um, the northern long-eared bat, which is one of our Michigan bats, can get right up to around 120 kilohertz. The very extent of human hearing tends to stop right around the lower range of echolocation, right around 20 kilohertz. So kids who can still hear kind of higher uh, frequencies than adults can, can occasionally hear the very lowest ranges of echolocation. Um, bats do produce a sound that's at a frequency humans can hear. It's kind of a chittering noise, but that's their communication call. That's not echolocation. Um, so in order to detect bat echolocation, we need the aid of technology. Um, so I'm gonna play a brief video here uh, and what you're going to see is a bat hunting insects and the chirps that you hear are the echolocation uh, that the bat's making as interpreted by technology. This video is also kind of fun because it does show off the bat hunting method in slow motion that you absolutely cannot see when they're zipping around the sky so quickly above you. They use their wings and their tails to catch the insects. Um, so like he just scooped, or she, uh, just scooped that bat up with uh, the potassium with the tail there um, and then dropped it apparently, so what a shame. Um, bats are not always successful when they're going for insects, you know, that, ooh, that's another failure. Um, uh, for some bats, you know, it's maybe around 40% of swoops are successful. Okay, so talking real quick about the bats that we have here in Michigan, a lot of these are going to be the same bats in a lot of states that are at least close to Michigan or share a border. But if you're a state that's a little further south, you might have a few bats that we don't. You might be missing some of the bats that we have. Um, the ones that I have here are the ones that I have personally uh, detected more than once in southeast Michigan. Um, these five species. So starting over at the left, the big brown bat there is easily the most common bat in this part of the state. Um, they are really neat bats. They're beetle specialists. They have a reinforced skull to help them crunch through beetle cases. So if you look at the skull of a big brown bat and compare it with one of the other bats, uh, you can tell the difference. It's really robust. Um, the red bats, the silver haired bats, and the hoary bats um, are less common than the big brown bats, but they're certainly still around. Um, all of the bats that I'm talking about will pretty much eat any insect they can get, but they have some sort of preferences, um, some things that they, they go for more than others. So the big brown bats are beetle specialists. Red bats tend to go for moths. Um, they eat a lot of moths. And then the little evening bat in the bottom there, um, has been observed focusing a lot on the adult version of the corn rootworm, which is a fairly serious agricultural pest. Um, remember the evening bat, because they're gonna, gonna come up again later when we're talking about actually doing the acoustic surveys. Um, but for right now, I will just say that the evening bats range uh, on official range maps barely gets into Michigan. It's like the two lowest count uh, rows of counties in the lower peninsula of Michigan that are generally accepted to be part of the evening bats range. Um, then the hoary bat kind of at the top there, that's our biggest bat in Michigan by, um, by a bit. Uh, they're really neat. They're really strong flyers um, and they're the only mammal endemic to Hawaii. So they have a really long range if they can stretch all the way from Michigan to Hawaii. Silver haired bats also fairly, uh, you'll, you'll get them a lot around here. Um, they're noted as kind of hanging out around water a lot. And then, so these four bats, um, I have not gotten in Southeast Michigan very often. I've gotten one reading for a tricolored bat in Southeast Michigan, um, but because it was only one and the technology isn't perfect, you know, who knows for absolute certain whether that really was a tricolored bat. Little brown bats are very common. Um, there's a line about halfway through the lower peninsula of Michigan. Once you go north of that line, 
the little brown bats uh, start to outpace the big brown bats as the most common bat um, around. Indiana bat is our endangered bat. It's been on the endangered species list for a very long time, partially because they only use, you know, most of the Indiana bats in the wild only use a handful of hibernacula. Um, so when they're hibernating, they're pretty much all going to about the same place um, or the same handful of places. So it's uh, a species of special concern for sure. Northern long-eared bat, that's another one that um, I don't tend to get in Southeast Michigan, but I've definitely got readings for uh, up on Mackinac Island, um, doing just a little bit of for fun bat detecting up there. Um, they have that really, really high frequency at like around 120 kilohertz. Um, so this is kind of an example of the way that um, physical data on bats still has to be taken and sort of the only surveying method for a long time, uh, these physical surveys using a mist net. So a mist net is essentially a big volleyball net, um, really big with ideally really thin uh, little strings uh, so that the bats aren't fully detecting it with echolocation is the idea. The problem, of course, is that it's very hard to make something thin enough that a bat can't pick it up with echolocation. Um, so sometimes you even get biased doing mist net surveys because you're getting some of the bats that um, maybe are very young or very old. Uh, and maybe are not the best flyers or not the best with echolocation. But the idea is to put up the net in um, a flyway somewhere that you know uh, bats are going to be flying. Ideally, a lot of the times this is right uh, out of their roost, right when they're leaving to go hunt for the night. You put the net up right there so that they leave uh, wherever they're hibern or not hibernating, wherever they're spending the day and fly right into the net. They get kind of tangled in the net. Um, you can take data. Uh, on them, you can, you know, measure things, whatever needs to be done, identify them for 100% certain, and then let them go again. But there are obviously some downsides to uh, this method of collecting data. You need people who really know what they're doing. You need people who are comfortable handling bats. Um, you're out there with the mist net for quite a few hours late at night. Um, so this is absolutely still a method that's important for collecting certain kinds of data. But if you're looking for sort of limited data, now there are options for acoustic surveying. And acoustic, you know, just picking up echolocation frequencies of bats is something we've been capable of doing for quite a while. Um, but in terms of actually being able to identify based off of those echolocation frequencies, that's something that um, for a long time, people who weren't really familiar with bats were not going to be able to do. Um, but methods are changing, and there are now ways that even if you know nothing about bats, you can start collecting some species data. So the North American Bat Monitoring Program is sort of a big um, U.S. government partnership program, the USDA, USGS, um, U.S. Forest Service, uh, all have some stuff to do with the North American Bat Monitoring Program. And I'm going to show you in the next slide what their protocol looks like. But whenever I'm talking about protocol for acoustic bat monitoring, it's taken straight from this uh, program. So the DNR, the Michigan DNR, was looking uh, to gather some data on the bats and the bat species and the bat species ranges throughout Michigan using volunteer groups. Um, so at one point, the Organization for Bat Conservation uh, was coordinating the bat surveys, the volunteer bat surveys in this part of Michigan, in Southeast Michigan. After its closure, the Detroit Zoological Society took over for a couple of years, coordinating uh, in Southeast Michigan, and they are still uh, the coordinator now. They did put a pause on the program this year, um, so we did not go out and collect data in 2022. Um, and these surveys are done as acoustic car surveys. Um, so what you're looking at in the top picture is that's me in the car and then Kennedy Phillips, who uh, was an employee of the Organization for Bat Conservation uh, and at the time was a grad student at Oakland University. Um, so that's the microphone on top of my car. That is the echo meter. And then that long wire goes down through the window and connects to an iPad or to your phone or to whatever you need to take the data off of. 
Um, what you're looking at, sort of that white block in between the microphone and the car, that's a chunk of styrofoam to reduce uh, frequency or to reduce vibrations on the microphone. Um, and it's connected with gaffer's tape so that it doesn't, you know, mess up the paint on my car. Um, and so I'm going to be spending a lot of the rest of this talk talking about how to do these acoustic surveys, how they work, um, what to do, what not to do. Uh, but that bottom right hand picture, that is the echo meter. So let's talk about that. Oh, here's the, um, the plan for North American bat monitoring program. If you type that into Google, it should pop up. I've, I've gotten it to pop up by typing really much vaguer things like North American bat monitoring protocol and see what pops up. Um, it's a really long document. Parts of it are quite technical. Uh, if you're not super familiar with bat monitoring or acoustic uh, ecology, but the um, section on conducting acoustic surveys is pretty clear. So in terms of equipment, everything I'm going to be talking about is using this type of echo meter, the Wildlife Acoustics Echo Meter Touch 2. I want to be clear, I'm not like paid by them, you know, they're not supporting this presentation or anything like that. That's just what we were using both with the Organization for Bat Conservation and the Detroit Zoological uh, Society when they were coordinating the surveys. Um, but there are lots of other options. I even found a big blog, uh, batdetecting.blogspot.com. It's in the bottom uh, of the box there. All there are tons of types of echo meters out there. This one's just really convenient for volunteers or people unfamiliar with bats to be able to use. So the software itself is totally free. Um, it's an app that anyone can download, Wildlife Acoustics Echo Meter Touch Bat Detector app or some variation of that title. Um, right now, the basic detector is $179 and $349 for the pro. Uh, when I checked the store yesterday, they had it for Android devices, but they did not have um, Apple in stock. Uh, so just take note of that. They certainly have before. Um, we, I've been doing the, our bat walks with an iPad with an echo meter. Um, and it's just on the Wildlife Acoustics website uh, is where we've acquired them. Um, in terms of the basic versus the pro, a lot of the times, unless you're doing a real study um, and really trying to get the best data possible. The basic is often great for what you need. You know, this is great as a community engagement event. I mentioned we've been doing bat walks. I'll talk about that a little, little more later. We just use the basic detector for that. The, the pro detector is really for research where you need a much narrower margin of error. Um, so when you take the echo meter, plug straight into a phone or an iPad, uh, the screen on the left there, that's the first thing you get. Um, it just tells you to plug in the echo meter if you want to use live mode, but there is stuff that you should do before surveying for bats um, as soon as you get the application, and that's the auto ID selection. So using this application, it will give you the two best guesses for a bat that is detected by this echo meter. Um, it will take the echolocation pattern, the frequencies, the stops, the starts, the pauses, um, and run it through an algorithm. The algorithm's name is Kaleidoscope. Um, and it, again, it's not the only algorithm for uh, identifying bats by their echolocation, but that's the one this software uses. Um, but in order to do that, you have to sort of tell the software where you are and what you're using. So if you click on the uh, three bars at the top left, uh, and then go down to auto ID selection, you'll get these screens. Um, so first off, selecting your region. And there's a big note there. I can summarize that note uh, in a sentence. This algorithm isn't perfect. Um, it's absolutely not 100% accurate. There are actually species of bats who are so similar in their echolocation. Um, that it's really difficult for the algorithm to tell them apart. So silver-haired bats and big brown bats are a big one in this region. They just create an echolocation pattern that's really, really similar um, to the point that a lot of the times a paper using this, uh, this method of bat IDing will just lump them together and say each of these data points is either a big brown bat or a silver-haired bat. On top of that, um, a full analysis of this data often requires using more than one method if you're doing like a true research paper. 
Um, so like the, the uh, data that I'm going to be talking about in a bit and that you'll see the results from uh, later in the presentation, used the kaleidoscope algorithm from uh, the echo meter and then also used a different algorithm uh, not connected to the echo meter and then also used a person um, who, uh, Georgia Arturi, uh, who is just very good at looking at those echolocation patterns and telling you what bad it was from the visual data of the audio spectrum, which I can't imagine trying to do. Um, and if two out of those three methods agreed, then they called that a positive ID. Um, but back to auto ID selection here. So uh, once you go to the auto ID selection, you uh, pick your state, and then you may still have to muck with it a little bit. Um, so again, I've been doing this in Michigan. If you click on Michigan, it auto selects eight out of our nine bat species, but it does not select the evening bat. Um, I have to imagine that's because the evening bat's range just barely gets up into Michigan. That being said, we have absolutely been detecting evening bats uh, consistently in our region here in Southeast Michigan. So I have been going through and just manually selecting evening bat. Um, you only have to do it the first time uh, after selecting Michigan as the state that I'm identifying in. Um, so if you're doing this in Michigan, that's the only one you should need to pick. If you're doing this in another state, just use another source, double check the species of bats that are in uh, your state. I use the Mammals of the Great Lakes book by Dr. Al Kurda um, to get a good idea of what's flying around in this state. Uh, so I would just recommend, you know, check another source uh, and make sure all of the bats that you might be detecting are clicked. Okay, so I mentioned earlier, this is just a quick look at our survey or at our service area in Southeast Michigan. This is the Six Rivers Land Conservancy service area. It's five counties. Um, and so when we were initially talking to the Detroit Zoological Society about taking over a few volunteer transects, um, the North American Bat Monitoring Program, one of the things that it's done is split up basically the entire country into a grid and then um, through a statistics program, and I'm, again, not a statistician either, uh, selected a couple of different grid cells as statistically significant cells. Um, so the idea being if every one of these statistically significant cells were monitored um, across our entire country, uh, which is a daunting task, um, then uh, we would have statistically significant data and have a pretty good idea of the bats that are in the country. Um, now, two of those statistically significant cells happen to be right next to each other in the Six River service area, Northern Oakland, Macomb County and lower to mid, um, or, sorry, Oakland County and lower to mid Lapeer County. Um, so we designed our driving routes. Once again, I want to reiterate, all of this protocol is taken from the North American Bat Monitoring Program from the USDA and the US uh, Forest Service. But in order to do a driving transect and get data on these bats, you really want to design your route really carefully. Um, because, OK, so first of all, if you have that echo meter strapped to the top of your car, you don't want to drive faster than 20 miles an hour both because you won't get good data on the bats and because it might shake the microphone off, neither of which are good. Um, you want to design your routes to be about 15 to 30 miles in length. Um, avoid most of the curves and switchbacks. Basically, you don't want to have any switchbacks that are too close. Um, and the reasoning behind that is that you don't want to pick up the same bat twice. Um, when you're doing this. We want every data point to be a different bat. Uh, and if you're, you know, the bats will feed over a fairly large area. So if you're making a lot of turns and switchbacks, it's gonna be really hard to be certain whether you've got different bats. Um, and then you ideally wanna sort of cover a bunch of different uh, habitat types within that area if possible, you know, pass some rural lands, pass some wetlands, pass some forested areas, go through an urban area. Um, vary it up. Uh, sometimes you do want to avoid really dense vegetation, but if it can't be avoided on your route, that's fine. Really dense vegetation just makes it more difficult for the echo meter to pick up that echolocation. 
Um, and then when you're actually going out to do the survey, you don't want rain or fog. Um, keep in mind that the bats are coming out to feed on insects. So a lot of what you're avoiding is anything that would make the insects stay down for the night. Um, so if it's raining, uh, if it's super, super foggy, the insects typically don't come out. Bats typically don't come out. If it's really windy, again, the uh, insects won't come out. So the bats won't come out. If it's unusually cold, this is usually something you're doing in the summer. Um, June and July are the months that are named uh, by the North American Bat Monitoring Program, but you could do it in August or September. Um, so uh, for Michigan, at least, uh, we used as a guideline, if it happens to be a cold summer night and it drifts below 50, maybe even 55 degrees Fahrenheit, again, the insects often won't be out and the bats won't be either. Um, in terms of starting, we were typically starting our surveys 30 minutes after sunrise, um, but you really get the best bat results about 45 minutes after sunrise. Um, so you also got to look up when sunset is. Um, all of this that I'm talking about too, this is just for driving routes. If you're just going out to collect data in a stationary way at a preserve, um, the monitoring conditions I would still pay attention to, but obviously you don't need to worry about any of this route selection stuff. Okay, so once you're actually out, you've got the echo meter plugged in. Um, I did skip a screenshot of this screen, but it just gives you a big green start button, press that. And then you also have to press the secondary, the record button if you want to activate the echo meters auto ID. Um, so a lot of the times if you are getting what sounds like bats, but you're not getting this little auto ID screen, uh, it's because the record button hasn't been selected. Um, so it does have to be recording in order to run it through the auto identification system. But this is typically what it looks like if you're getting bats. Um, so the top screen, it will tell you the two best guesses uh, that it has for the, the identification. Um, so if you're doing this stationary and you only see one bat flying around uh, and you're detecting it over and over with your echo meter and like nine times out of 10, it told you the, the top guess was a big brown bat. And then once out of 10, it told you it was a silver haired bat. It's probably a big brown bat. Um, for doing the driving transects, we're trying to only get each bat once. So that's why we're using those secondary methods to confirm the identification as well. Um, and then the, so interpreting the audio data, you don't really need to if you're just looking for species, um, but just for kind of interest sake. So right below where it says little brown myotis on the top screen, you can see all these like swooshes, like they look almost like a, um, an inverse of the Nike swoosh or something like that. Uh, so that is one pulse by the bat and the bat will make multiple pulses. So um, spit out multiple sounds uh, while it's tracking its prey. They tend to start at high frequency and kind of swoop down to a lower frequency, each pulse does. So um, the Y axis there is the frequency ranging from about 120 to about 20. Um, and you will start to get an idea. If you do this often enough, you really can start to get a little bit of an idea of the different echolocation patterns from different bats. The easiest one to me is always the big brown bats because they always feel like they're screaming. Um, it's really loud coming out from the echo meter compared to a lot of the other bats. Um, but once again, it'll give you the two best guesses. Uh, and then depending on how you're taking the data, you can just write down the two best guesses. You can pick your favorite. Um, but the top guess is the one that it's pretty sure it is. And then uh, since you've hit record, it also records all of those echolocation um, patterns. So you can review them again later. I know these codes look uh, baffling, but they're actually, they're just based off the scientific names of the bats. So all the ept fuss um, on the left screen, that's eptesicus fuscus, that's the big brown bat. Um, so all of those you're looking at are the big brown bat. Uh, the 7S, 12S, 14S to the right, that's how many seconds long the recording is. And the little yellow bat logo means that it is a confirmed bat as far as the uh, algorithm's concerned. 
You can also review all the recordings that you have on the phone. Um, I tend to rip a bunch of the recordings out of my phone at periodic intervals because they just take up storage space on the phone. Uh, but at the time I took this screenshot, this is sort of what I had on, on the phone. Um, and again, all those are just uh, scientific names of bats. Not ID'd means that it thinks that was probably a bat, but it didn't get a good identification on it. Noise, um, you can... Uh, click a box to save what it calls noise, which is where it started recording because it thought maybe this was a bat and then was like, no, this probably isn't a bat um, and threw it out. Uh, and I know there are some researchers who do keep the noise recordings because then they can, if they're looking for stuff other than bats, that can be useful to get um, some of those audio recordings as well. And then if you're allowing the app access to your GPS on your phone, you can also uh, sort of take a look at where a lot of these bats are. So these are three different screens with various levels of zoom. Um, that first one is just showing how many uh, recordings I have in sort of those broad areas. I zoomed in on Drayton Plains Nature Center in Waterford Township, um, which Six Rivers has a conservation easement with Waterford Township over most of Drayton Plains Nature Center. Uh, and I did a public bat walk out there. So these are all the recordings from that. Um, you can kind of see even vaguely the path we took. Uh, and then that last screen is zooming in uh, even further. So Las Boar in the center, Lasiurus borealis, that's the red bat. Um, so we got a red bat there. We got two more that it's not telling me because of the uh, frequency of zoom. And then we got something that was not identified. Um, now you don't have to allow the app um, access to your GPS. You can also, uh, or to your phone GPS, you can also connect it to like a different GPS entirely. So like a Garmin. Um, so when we were doing the vehicle transects, we were syncing our iPad with uh, a Garmin GPS unit and using that GPS data, which may be a little more accurate depending on how good your phone's GPS is. So this is sort of what the results screen looked like after doing some of those driving transects. You'll, um, you'll note that it just says, it says big brown, eastern red, hoary, and evening. That big brown data point, I believe they did do for this one lumped together, big brown and silver haired bats. Uh, this is not a transect I did, um, to be clear, but it was part of one of the ones the Detroit Zoological Society uh, coordinated. This is actually one down in Crosswinds Marsh. I picked this one just because it looks really pretty. Um, it's got a, you can see they were detecting bats pretty much everywhere along their route. Um, most common was big brown, without a doubt, in this part of southeast Michigan. That's pretty much always going to be the most common. It looks like they got a decent number of hoary bats too, especially along kind of that northern part of the route and the eastern part of the route. They got a handful of red bats and the evening bat. So I was mentioning earlier that the evening bat is kind of an iffy one um, because it's it barely gets into our state, or at least that's kind of been the classical interpretation of the evening bat's range. But we've been picking them up. I was picking one up in Lapeer County um, in Dryden very consistently. Um, and okay, if it had only been once, I would have been perfectly happy to throw out that data point as probably an error. You know, maybe the, the algorithm mis-ID'd it. But we got it in approximately the same spot multiple nights. Um, so what exactly this means is one of the cooler things about doing these bat acoustic surveys is it's a way to get a lot more data on bat ranges uh, than has been practical to get before. So whether that means, you know, the evening bat has always been in sort of these uh, middle or slightly nor northern southern parts of the state, um, or whether it's starting to move northwards, um, as we're seeing a lot of different animals do and a lot of different small mammals in particular do, I don't know for sure. Um, it's still pretty uncommon, you know, I think it looks like they maybe only had one data point for an evening bat. Um, so it's possible it's always been around and it's just been rare and hasn't been detected very often. It's also possible that it's on the move. So few obstacles that I do want to talk about um, in no particular order. You know, these are not necessarily um, 
things that are going to stop you from doing this. It's just stuff that you should have in the back of your mind if you are interested in like doing a, a driving transect or even if you're just interested in going out to a preserve and seeing what bats are there. Um, traffic, you will be driving consistently 20 miles an hour as much as you try and design your route so that you're not gonna be in anyone's way, inevitably you'll be in someone's way at some point. Um, but for the most part, we didn't have too many problems with this. Um, the drivability of routes was a bit more of a problem. I went and surveyed our routes and drove them myself, um, you know, I, I think just a couple of weeks before we were actually driving them for the bats uh, one year and we still got construction started <laughs> partway through one of our routes. Uh, and we had to kind of go around it and go a different squiggly way. Um, so that's something to be aware of if you're going to do a driving transect, pre-drive your route as like in as close a time frame before your actual surveys as you can manage. Stopping and starting is something that it takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, so whenever you stop, once again, whether you're at a stop sign or a red light, once again, we are trying not to get the same bat twice. So if you stop, and especially if there are bats nearby that you just detected, you pause the recording, pause the echo meter, and then start it again once you're driving again in an attempt to not be picking up the same bats twice. Um, occasionally, the app will freeze. That seems to depend a lot on whatever technology you're using to run it. And it also depends a little bit on, you know, um, how much data you're getting. Storage space is a problem for me, uh, I've noticed, because I both do a ton of pictures for Six Rivers as part of monitoring conservation easements and taking a look at our preserves, tons of pictures for that, and also taking pictures for our Six Rivers social media. So I tend to have a lot of high quality pictures in my phone and over the length of recording bats for like two hours, those audio files can start to build up really quickly. So just make sure you have a good amount of storage space on your phone or iPad or whatever you're using. So I have a bullet point here, neighbors slash law enforcement. Look, you're driving around with a microphone on top of your car. To some people that's going to look a little suspicious. Um, so I have been followed by a cop, um, didn't end up pulling me over or anything. I had a big sign in the rear view mirror that said bat monitoring in progress. Um, and so he just, he just followed us for a few miles in, uh, in the midst of our transect, probably just checking out what we were doing. I pulled over at one point and stopped recording to see if he wanted to come up and chat and he didn't, he just pulled over with us and kept following. Um, so having some sort of signage in your rear view or if you can do something on the side of your car, I think is a good idea. Um, because if you have something that says driving slow, bat monitoring in progress, you know, hopefully that's going to uh, assuage some concerns. And then lastly, bat unpredictability. Once again, we don't know a ton about some of our bat species around here. I mean, we are collecting data, as much data as we can um, but we don't know every factor that uh, affects where they feed um, or if they're going to come out in a certain night. I've even said, seen some stuff uh, saying that phases of the moon can have an effect um, on where the bats are going to be or if they're feeding, uh, presumably because of additional moonlight. Um, so it's, you may go to an area one night and get tons of bats and you may go back to it and get like nothing. Okay, and community engagement. This is a great community engagement event. We've gotten really good turnouts whenever we've done bat hikes. I will say as a community engagement event, the, the most important thing to be thinking about is timing um, because the bats, again, often don't come out until maybe around sunset, occasionally a little before sunset. Certain species might come out a little before sunset. Um, 30 minutes after sunset, depending on the time of year, is a late time to start an event. So often the way we'll do this is start the event a little before uh, sunset, go out for a hike at the park or preserve that we're holding the event, and then sort of turn the bat detectors on and we're, you know, we may, we may turn them on earlier, but we're most likely going to be getting the bats sort of on the way back. Um, and that's fine. Most people are good with that. Um, 
you can see too, it's, it is a fun thing for kids. Um, I will say though, you know, you need a decent number of echo meters to hold a good community engagement event. Not everyone needs to have an echo meter at all times. People are pretty understanding that it's an expensive piece of equipment. You'll have to trade it around. Um, but you at least need some for Android, ideally some for iPhone as well, because you don't know what people are going to bring. Um, and then you do have to go through the process with them of like doing the auto ID selection, selecting your state, adding whatever bat you need to add. Um, but it's a fun thing to explain and people tend to get pretty into it. Um, so I really do think it's sort of an unusual way to do a community engagement event. Um, the advantages are it's during a time when a lot of people are free because you're doing it in the evening. Um, even if it's a weekday, oftentimes people are, you know, willing to come to an evening event. Um, we've been doing them for free. We haven't been charging uh, for our bat walks, um, but we were able to raise for our Giving Tuesday campaign, raise uh, money to get a bunch of echo meters to do these bat, walk, bat walks. So that took out a lot of the uh, sort of beginning costs. Um, but it's a great way to get people out to some of your preserves or to parks or any land that you think people would be interested in seeing. And you can talk about all sorts of stuff while you're doing a bat walk. I would maybe recommend um, going out there yourself in the evening beforehand uh, and kind of scouting around and seeing if bats are around. Um, they can be surprising. Uh, they'll often go to what we call feeding corridors, which is like a long, often strip kind of of land with a lot of the times it looks like, you know, an alleyway with trees on either side. They'll happily fly straight down those alleyways, those feeding corridors to hunt. Um, so that's a good spot to look for. And over water is always great. Um, they'll often like to feed right over a pond or river lake. Um, and then lastly, uh, lights. You know, they love street lamps because street lamps gather insects. Um, so I have absolutely done a bat walk before where we got nothing for the entire hike, came back out to the parking lot, and there was a street lamp that had big brown bats all over it. Um, so to wrap up, all I want to um, say sort of to conclude here is I... Um, was really excited when the Stewardship Network reached out about this. I don't think it's the sort of thing where, you know, every time we're making a baseline document, every time we're doing a management plan, every time we're collecting species data, uh, we need to be adding bats to it. But I will say that it's possible now. Um, it's something that we can do uh, when we're tr trying to make a grant application or something and trying to say, hey, these are the species that are out on this property that are important. That's our one that we can start adding now. Or if you want to put it in a baseline document, that's now feasible. Um, so I, I hope that everyone listening to this uh, is feeling good about, about bats in general and about their capabilities of going out and if you want to get data on bats on your protected lands. Ian, thank you so much. So completely Absolutely. amazing, right? I think I think there will be several of us who are who are buying echo meters and, and <laughs> looking for bats. Maybe um, I should have tried to get sponsored by Wild Bats. I know, Houston. right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so a um, couple different questions. Mary says, uh, exciting and motivating um, and a project within reach. So thanks for sharing it. So talk, can you talk a little bit more about the protocol for using the app while walking trails? And, you know, you might pick up the same bat twice. Um, yeah. What's the protocol for stop and start on that? So... If you are just walking a trail, I think you're just going to have to accept that you're going to get a species or an individual bat more than once. Great. Um, Great. I don't think there's much you can do to really avoid it. Um, I have known people to do biking transects, uh, which maybe that works um, for not getting the same individual more than once. But if you're just walking, I think it's very likely that um, you're just going to be getting sort of a species composition. Yep. Um, now, the good thing about walking is if you do get the same bat multiple times, uh, it's running the echolocation pattern through the algorithm multiple times. So if all those say the same thing, you're a little more confident that you have the correct species. That's great. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Um, Jack asked another question. In addition to big brown bats, what bats in Southeast Michigan roost in colonies as opposed to more individually? Have there been any efforts to document the locations of the larger bat colonies in Southeast Michigan? So 
I will say that um, the big brown bats are definitely our most famous colony of roosters for Southeast Michigan. A lot of the other bats that we have around here tend to be either roosting and hibernating individually or um, maybe in smaller groups or they're using the same hibernacula, but they're spreading out a little more and they're not those big dense colonies. Um, so there is a lot of research on bat hibernacula. It's one of the only times that you can potentially be pretty sure you're going to find bats is going out to their hibernacula. A lot of the hibernacula that our bats use, uh, even if they're in Southeast Michigan, they may not be using hibernacula in Southeast Michigan. They may migrate a little bit and then hibernate. Um, our more famous bat hibernacula in Michigan are definitely the, the northern mines, you know, the old abandoned copper mines yeah. yep. uh, and the iron mines up north. Um, and you will see now, I chose not to touch on white nose syndrome for the sake of time, right. um, but you will see now a lot of those hibernacula are protected as a way to stop spreading an invasive fungus that's affecting a lot of um, hibernating bats called white nose syndrome. So if you see bars over a cave or a mine or something, it's for the sake of the bats, please don't go in. That's great. Yeah. Um, so Virginia asked a question. She tuned in, Virginia, I think you tuned in a couple minutes after the beginning. So she asked a question about um, bats that might visit hummingbird feeder. And oh. she, someone told me there were, but I thought those were more tropical. And you had a great picture in the very beginning. Yes. So that is not something you're going to get in Michigan, but it is something you can get in the Southwest. Um, so there are bats in the Southwest that are legitimate pollinators. They'll even, uh, you know, they're, they're very important, some of them for pollinating tequila um, and for the, the cactus that tequila comes from. Um, so that's not something you're going to see here, but that is something you can see in the U.S. You just have to go uh, Southwest. Yep, that's great. Um, another couple questions for you um, about the range of bats. You know, you talked about, and then there was also an earlier question from Becky about, um, do you have the source for the study that said that one bat could um, feed insects on two acres? I used to. Um, okay, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll search for it. We'll, and we'll and it out that. Yeah. yeah that archive. Yep. Okay. Um, I know I, I, I did find a study. I didn't just make that number up, but <laughs> um, I may have it in my notes somewhere. Okay, great. Um, and then Mark asked a question about the, what's the detection range for the pro versus the basic echolocator? Does that vary with species for a small site? Can it get an estimate of numbers? It, Do the um, not different from the older ones? Oh, of the pro, the pro still cannot distinguish between different individual bats. The, the patterns of echolocation are just too similar. Yeah. Um, so I, as far as I know, there is not a detector that can tell you 100% how many bats you have around. Yep. Um, but uh, in terms of range, I honestly don't know if there's a difference. I've used both. I haven't noticed one, but of course the problem is you're not often seeing the bats you're detecting. You can be if you're doing a bat hike and you're looking for them and you know where they're gonna be. Um, so unfortunately I have to say, I'm not sure. I will say I've found often if I can see a bat, even the basic can pick it up. Yeah. Um, so if, if it's in visual range that you can identify, yes, that's definitely a bat and it's not a swallow, um, then it, it, the bat detector can most likely pick it up. Yep, that's great. And so then here's a question that Steve asked, does this touch to device and software work without internet access? Yes, so you need to download the app with internet access. Um, but once you've got the app downloaded, um, and you know you should probably first turn it on somewhere with internet because it might need to update or something. Yep. Um, but then, yeah, while we're using this driving, doing these driving transects, we have no access to internet. Yep. Okay, great. And then um, Justin asked the question. You you told us how you mount the you mount the mic on top of a little piece of styrofoam and then you tape it. Um, he also asked, you know, so he asked a little bit more about that again. And then he also asked, can you just hold your phone open next to the open window? <laughs> you could. I mean, I wouldn't recommend doing it while driving, um, <laughs> but your passenger? for any of those driving transects, it's really a two-person job at yeah. the least. It's, um, you know, I've, I've done them often as a three-person job, and even that is helpful. Um, theoretically, you probably could. Uh, you might, 
yeah, it, if you were careful to hold it in the same orientation and not waver it around too much, they do also create car mounts for echo meters, which I've used those too. It's just that picture happened to be the sort of DIY version where you do a block of styrofoam yep. and the, um, the echo meter on top of it. Um, so there are, there are car mounts that are typically suction cups um, that you can put an echo meter onto. I'll be honest, I'm not sure where to look for those. Mm -hmm. Google. Google. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody else can drop it in the chat and move somebody else knows. Yeah, if um, anyone else knows, go for it. Exactly. And then um, Steve asked a little bit about the, what's the current status of the Indiana and long-eared bats? Okay, so the northern long-eared bat is something that we we only get in northern, um, a little further north in Michigan. I'll be honest, I'm not sure their status right now. The Indiana bat has been on the endangered species list for a very long time. Unfortunately, it has been one of the bats that's been hit worst by um, white nose syndrome yep. because they are such clumping um, hibernators in so few hibernacula, they were hit really hard by white nose syndrome. Yep. Um, so their populations are probably looking worse than when they were originally put on the endangered species list. Um, so white nose syndrome uh, it does not affect every species of bat, even around here. It's only affecting bats that um, hibernate together for the most part. Uh -huh. It's a cold loving cave dwelling fungus. So it tends to only be hitting bats that are hibernating in cold caves or mines or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but for those species, it can have a 90 to 95% mortality rate, something like that. That's great. Good. Let me ask you one final question and then we will wrap up so that people can get where they need to go at the top of the hour. And Jack asks, during hibernation, do bats make enough sound to be picked up by the echolocator? They, I don't believe they're echolocating during hibernation. Yep. Um, okay. That is generally something that they're doing a little bit for navigation, but it's really more of a hunting thing. And while they're hibernating, they're not um, hunting at all. You can hear them. They will occasionally make that little like chittering noise. Um, that's kind of, even that, uh, you hopefully shouldn't be hearing too, too much during hibernation. Yep. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Great. Good, good. Well, Ian, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Really appreciate you all online um, joining us for the Stewardship Network's monthly webcast. As I said, they're on each and every second Wednesday of the month. We'll be right back here next, uh, next month in September with Nicole Ferguson talking about outside the box, creating unique stewardship opportunities to spread your mission and your passion farther. And so thank you all online. Look forward to being with you next month. Keep staying safe and engaged and reach out to us. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you in the intervening month. Ian, lots of um, appreciation and love for the presentation in the chat. So thank oh, you great. so much for joining us. Really appreciate that. Well, thank you all for coming. <laughs>